people on the road, the question I always ask is, what are some of the favorite places that you've been? And this is an especially important question to me when I meet fellow hikers. And I met these guys, I don't know how many years ago, and they had been all over the world, hiked everywhere that I could even think of to ask them about. And they both replied that Isle Royale National Park was their most favorite of all. And I never forgot that. I'm not sure I'd even heard of it at that point. So when I was on my road trip this summer in Sophie, my converted camper van, when I reached the northern Midwest, I was determined that I was going to make my way over to Isle Royale. On today's show, we will visit this national park, a very remote island that's actually closer to Canada than it is to its home state of Michigan. And we'll find out why it's the least visited of the national parks in the lower 48, but it's the most revisited. Let's find out why, and let's get started. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. I'm super excited to share with you one of my favorite adventures of the entire road trip this year in Sophie. But before we get started, I want to remind you that our Active Travel Adventures guided group tour of a 170 mile hike across Costa Rica from the Caribbean to the Pacific is on for April 2022. There are still a couple spots left, so if you're interested, be sure to reach out to me at kit at activetraveladventures.com so I can get you the information. This may very well be the hardest but most rewarding adventure you might ever go on. And it's going to be gorgeous. I mean, it is Costa Rica, and we're going to be going through all five ecosystems. I am so excited, and I can't wait. We're putting together a really fun group of people. Now, on to Isle Royale National Park. Today, we are going to be exploring one of the United States' hidden treasures. It's not hidden because people can't find it, but rather because it's so dang difficult to get to that hardly anyone goes there. The average visit to a national park is under a day, often only a few hours. People will stop in the visitor center, drive by the highlights, and consider that they've done the park. Check that box. Denali, another difficult national park to get to, has an average stay of 15.3 hours, often because their visit is part of a larger Alaskan tour and they might only have two hours to explore. It's only because there are some who make the effort to go just to see Denali that the average time makes it to that 15 hour mark. Let's compare that to this week's park where the average stay is three and a half days, not hours. There is nothing else along the way. So to get to this park, you truly have to go there because this is your final destination. Isle Royale National Park is tucked in the northwest corner of Lake Superior, quite close to the Canadian border it's near Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. In Michigan, I actually didn't really realize what an odd-shaped state that is. So if you Google Michigan map, you'll see what I'm talking about. But So it's in the upper northwest corner of the state. Isle Royale is a land of vast wilderness and contrasts, where the wildlife outnumbers the humans. It can be cozy or harsh, gentle or ruthless, striking or unnerving, and it can change on a dime or just around a corner. I backpacked the island for almost a week during the last week of June. As the week progressed, the island unveiled its charms. Isle Royale is known to the native peoples as Minang, translated as the good place. As mentioned, it's the lower 48's least visited national park with only 19,000 visitors a year. Yet those intrepid souls that take the trouble often return because it has become the National Park System's most revisited park. And it has the longest average stay at three and a half days versus just a few hours, typical of the other parks. And let's think about that for a minute. You keep hearing me talk about how busy all the national and state parks are these days. So let's do some simple math. If there are 19,000 annual visitors, and let's say 20% stay at the lodge, that means maybe 15,000 are backpacking which is your only other option. Because of the extreme winter weather, the park is open six and a half months each year or 195 days. That works out to being about 80 people backpacking on any given day. Doing a bit more math, with the size of the main island, that means that each of us backpackers have about four acres to ourselves. 
No wonder I hardly saw anyone. You can't beat that. Isle Royale boasts 165 miles of trails, most I found to be moderate in difficulty and, frankly, along the shoreline, fairly level. What makes it difficult is that to see much of the island, you have to backpack. You can day hike if you have lodging at the, at the historic lodge, otherwise you've got to backpack. And if you're not a backpacker, still stay tuned because I have a couple of workarounds that you can do to make it a little bit easier for you. Plus, of course, you can stay in the lodge and do day hikes. The highest elevation in Isle Royale is 1,334 feet, but the lake sits at 600 feet. So unless you're going up and down the ridge line, there isn't a whole lot of major ascents or descents. The archipelago of over 200 islands consists of close to 600,000 acres and over 300 miles of shoreline that the Chippewa natives released to the U.S. government back in 1843 when deep veins of copper were discovered. This started a mining frenzy bigger than the gold rush. It only took the miners two years to deplete the easy ore before it pinched out and the area quieted down once more. On the island, you'll see remnants of old aboriginal copper pits signs of former fur trading posts, and abandoned mines from the 1844 copper rush. The main island of Isle Royale is the largest in Lake Superior, and within the island you'll find 70 lakes, which draws lots of paddlers in addition to the hikers. Around here, Lake Superior dictates the weather. The lake itself stays around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which commonly brings the rains and fogs in the summer, and blankets the island with tons of snow in the winter. I was lucky and only had one foggy afternoon, yet when I was on top of the fire tower, it was clear on the north side, looking over to Canada, but just below me south, over by the harbor, I couldn't see a thing but white fog, as if the island was divided in half horizontally. The reason so few people make it to Isle Royale is because of its remoteness. The only way that you can get here is by boat or seaplane. The archipelago is located in Lake Superior's northwest corner, kind of near where Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan meet, and it sits around five miles south of Canada. You can take a ferry from either Minnesota or Michigan. I'm going to give you a heads up. If you get seasick, I would recommend the seaplane or coming over from the Minnesota side because it's about 20 miles distance by ferry versus the 50-mile ferry ride that I took. I got lucky in that the lake was like glass on my trip over, but on the way back, with just two feet of rolling waves for the, the almost four-hour trip, I was a bit green, as were most of the other folks on the ferry. When you arrive and first enter the harbor, be sure to pay special attention to the rock outcroppings. Here is a great way to see the interesting tilt of the many bedrock layers. About a billion years ago, around here, the Earth's crust ripped open and released lava, which then hardened into basal salt. Now rinse and repeat more than 400 times over millions of years, and you'll get a many, many layered chocolate rock cake. Later, major geological forces cracked the Earth, shifting and thrusting this layered rock cake upwards and tilted it back at around a 45 degree angle. Later still, Miles thick glaciers retreated, dragging and scarring the rock as it melted, deepening the valleys between the two island ridges. And a mere 11,000 years ago, the last glacier melted. This meltwater, now trapped within a deep basin surrounding the rock cake layers, created one of the Earth's largest lakes and immersed all but the top layers of the rock layered cake underwater. Eventually, life took hold. First came, of course, the plants. On Isle Royale, you'll find four main ecosystems, or at least four that I saw. Number one, the rugged coastline, which I found to be especially pretty along the Skull Trail up to Scoville Point. And that's something you can day hike from the lodge. I actually thought that was the prettiest hike of the whole trip. Number two, you'll also see lichen-covered bedrock. Here you will see how the land and the rock pushed up, releasing lava, which then hardened into the basal rock. Broken down rock and blown in sand and soil forms pockets of sedimentation that allows plants to root. So on the bedrock, you'll see virtual meadows of wildflowers and ground covered junipers all along the sunny banks of the bedrock. Tough old junipers, because they can withstand the harsh winds and cold, came first. Their foliage then traps soil as their spreading roots tightly grip the bedrock. So now the wildflowers have a place to grow. 
Late June, when I went, was a great time to see wildflowers. Bedrock banks were covered with daisies and some cute bright orange button-like flowers, along with a medley of yellow blossoms. Lichen is suspected to be the first arrival to the island. It's also the canary in the coal mine when it comes to air quality, as they're wonderful pollution absorbents, and we can test them for sulfur to get a good idea about the current air pollution situation. So in addition to the coastline and the bedrock, the third ecosystem we find is the dark forest areas filled with spruce, fir, pine, birch, and aspen, which shade a huge variety of wildflowers and a multitude of orchids. I also saw a remarkable waxy red-flowered carnivorous pitcher plant, tons of ferns, and an abundance of thimbleberry, which you can gorge on, I'm assuming, late July. Ironically, sun-loving aspen and birch create shade, which then inhibits their own seedlings, and so are eventually replaced by the evergreens as the forest matures. The fourth and final ecosystem I saw were the wet zones, found in the valleys between the two ridges. These valleys were formed by the tilted rock layers, and then the retreating glaciers carved them even deeper. Here's where you're going to find streams, lakes, and swamps. The water gets trapped on the bedrock underneath, so it can't drain. In the swamps, you'll find verns, whom you'll meet in a little bit, beloved skunk cabbage, some marsh marigolds, horsetail, and alder. As these plants decompose and the soil builds, these will give way to other woodland plants. Beavers are abundant on the islands and create loads of boggy areas as well. The beavers dam up streams faster than the maintenance crews can put in rock steps or boardwalks, so expect your feet to get wet regularly. Many types of wildflowers, including 28 types of wild orchids, of which I was lucky to see many, include one of my favorites, both the pink and the yellow lady slippers that were in full bloom when I was there. And I love that waxy pitcher plant. That was really cool. After the plants arrive, then come the animals. And frankly, because it's so remote, you're more likely to see animals than people. On Isle Royale, there are 20 mammal species, only half of those found on the nearby mainland. And some of the animals that could make the trip rarely do so. It's some big open water they'd have to cross with no land in sight. However, those that did make it include the moose, gray wolf, beavers, muskrat, red foxes, snowshoe hare, mink, river otters, and red squirrels. I was fortunate enough to see two moose while here. More on those exciting sightings later. In fact, Isle Royale is home to the largest herd of moose in the U.S. Oddly, there are no bear or deer because unlike the moose and wolves, none have made that long journey to this remote location. And one of my favorites, Isle Royale also has loons. I just love their haunting call. They have four different calls, apparently, each with a purpose, and you're sure to hear a serenade at dusk whether or not you see them. But over time, the island's animal species change. A hundred years ago, there were no moose or wolves. Caribou, no longer here, ruled the day, hunted by also now missing predator coyotes and lynx. And speaking of predators, the island's isolation allows for some interesting predator-prey relationship studies. For example, a good year of moose breeding leads to a moose baby boom. And when they're old and vulnerable, these moose, survivors of the earlier moose baby boom, abound. Wolves then flourish because of the vulnerable moose that they're able to catch, and fewer calves survive. This leads to a moose decline, which then causes the wolf to decline, which causes then the moose to increase with yet another baby boom, and the cycle repeats over and over and over again. I got lucky, and on the back side of my final hike, I saw a mama loon with her two chicks. May and June is the nesting season, and your best shot to see them. I also saw several loon pairs, chickless I'm afraid, over at the Daisy Farm dock as well. Near Scoville Point, there's a bald eagle's nest right above the trail, so you can see it really well. I watched mom or dad guarding the two chicks I heard about for about 10 minutes before the parent decided to set out to get some more food for the little ones. During my adventure, I also saw a few random small snakes, mostly garters, plus a single tiny deer mouse over by the lodge, and the deer mouse is the only small rodent on the island. Nearby Ontario nearly has six species, which shows you how limited the species variety is over here. There are also several kinds of bats, and I got to see some at dusk at the harbor. 
I considered my final hike doing a figure eight of trails up and around Scoville Point a perfect trifecta, since I saw a moose, a bald eagle, and the loons. Plus, it was absolutely spectacular weather and my favorite landscape on the island. It was a great way to end my adventure. My backpacking adventure itself was for six days. I wanted to allow enough time to truly experience the park, although I'd never be able to visit all 36 campgrounds they have scattered across this 45 mile by nine mile main island. That's the one thing I definitely liked. With so few people scattered all across the island, you feel like you're all alone in the wild. And I'm guessing that's why those two hikers that I met love this place so much. The weather this far north can be vicious, so no one lives here permanently. The park is generally only open from mid-April through October. You should come prepared for all four seasons, regardless of the month you visit. Reservations to get here are required, and you should book far in advance to depart from the gateway of your choice. You have the choice of either Grand Portage or Grand Marais, Minnesota, or Copper Harbor, or Hoyton, Michigan. I had wanted to paddle Boundary Waters in Minnesota before heading to Isle Royale and then take the Grand Portage Ferry over, but I wasn't able to get a seat. So I had to drive around Lake Superior to Copper Harbor. Lake Superior, I might add, is the largest lake by surface area in the world with over 400,000 acres. But as usual, life ends up turning out fine, even if you think it wasn't the right plan for you to start with. The week I'd wanted to go had horrible cold rainy weather. So I would end up having only type two fun, meaning it's only fun looking back, not at the time, particularly backpacking. The week I was there was pretty darn nice with only one rainy day and gratefully it was warm rain and it even didn't even rain the full day. Previously, when I backpacked, I'd never carried more than four days worth of food with me. So six days was about all I thought I could haul and that's why I made my reservations accordingly. You need about one and a half pounds of food per day. So use that as a rough guideline to figure out what your weight's gonna be on your back. And I hadn't backpacked in a couple of years. And even though I've been hiking like crazy lately, I haven't been training with a loaded pack. So I was concerned a little bit about my ability to do so. I hoped I hadn't made a stupid judgment error and risked blowing out one of my knees before this big Italian Dolomites hike I've got going on in September. As I mentioned earlier, you don't have to backpack Isle Royale, although most people do. It's the best way to see the island. Most people also bring over their own food, although there is a tiny camp store with limited supplies. At the harbor, you'll also find a grill and a restaurant for those staying at the lodge or cabins or if you're, or if you're camping nearby. And if you fish, get a permit and you'll be able to fish in Lake Superior, but you don't need a permit to fish the inland lakes and streams. So if you like to fish, bring a case for your rod to take on the ferry and check the hook restrictions. In fact, two backpackers I met were catching most of their food and that saves a ton of weight on your back. You can also do some really nice day hikes right from the harbor itself. To get a true backcountry experience, you're either gonna to need to backpack or paddle. One important caution, this is not a first time backpackers trip. On the trails here, they generally are not maintaining the vegetation. Instead, they keep it real, they keep it wild. Winter itself knocks back the vegetation and then come spring through fall, the hikers themselves pack down the trail. And the trails are not blazed and only in a few places are there rock carns or on the bedrock indicating which way to trek. In short, these trails are untamed, wild. I was there at the end of June the thimbleberry and ferns along some sections of the trail were chest high and touching each other across the trail. Personally, I would not backpack deep in the back country July or August as I think the trails are going to be a bit too overgrown. I'd go earlier in the season. So to me, I think May and June are probably the best months and you're likely to beat the dreaded and annoying black fly and mosquitoes. I had read a review before I went there that the island was worth all the bug bites. I also read that the black fly is truly annoying and they bite. So I came super prepared with DEET as much as I hate to use it, plus a bug head net. And though even though both pests had already emerged, I never saw any of the black fly, and for the most part, the mosquitoes were pretty tolerable. About half the days I put DEET on my clothes, 
Mostly I found the mosquitoes just flitting about me annoyingly, but I rarely got bitten. Unlike my late husband, I am not bug bait where bugs zoom to, and I only saw four people all week wearing a head net, so I think my experience was pretty typical for my season there. At night, though, when I was in my tent for around an hour, it seemed, at dusk, all the mosquitoes in the woods were trying to get inside, screaming on the outside of my tent. It was loud and unnerving, but I was safe from them, and eventually they went away, and I could sleep in peace. On the island, you're going to have zero cell service. Plus, you're often going to be alone. On two out of my six days, I did not see a soul all day. The park does a good job of putting up signposts wherever a trail intersects. So as long as you can see the trail, you're unlikely to get too lost. But should you get hurt or otherwise be in trouble, you're on your own and help is a long way away. Real medical care is a long helicopter ride away, presuming the weather permits it. You'll need to be self-sufficient, and if you get into trouble, you're going to have to figure out a way to self-rescue. I'm going to put a link to my Adventure Travel Show podcast episode on wilderness safety and first aid in the show notes. Before I left the mainland, I downloaded the main trails on my All Trails app. Nonetheless, I had to expect that even though I kept my phone in airplane mode the entire time just to save some juice, that I was likely to lose power before I made it back to the harbor six days later. When you arrive at the harbor, the ranger's going to give you a permit that you attach to your backpack, and then you have to tell him or her your intended itinerary. You're allowed to modify it, but they, if they have to come looking for you, at least they have an idea of what your plan was. And there's a ferry that runs around the perimeter of the island, so you can take it either to hike or to paddle a different section of the island. Because the ferry takes such a long time to get around, I chose just to hike from Rock Harbor, where I landed, rather than give up the day to get elsewhere on the island. As far as trails go, some people like to walk the 40 plus mile length along the Greenstone Ridge. You'll have more ups and downs along this trail than the coastal trails, but the biggest elevation change isn't going to be more than 700 feet. There are actually two ridges on this island, so you could also walk along the Mingong Ridge as well. And I heard that you're all but guaranteed to see moose along the Felbin Loop and over at Macrosi. So what attracts people to Isle Royale? I found two types of people visit here. Those that want a truly remote, untamed wilderness experience, and those that are trying to visit all the national parks of the United States. The latter, which makes up probably around a quarter to a third of the visitors I met, tend to stay at the lodge. But here's a cool tip. Even if you aren't a hardcore backpacker, you can take advantage of the really nice shelters that some of the campsites have. I would, of course, still bring a tent, but when available, I stayed at these shelters. Some campgrounds had multiple shelters. Note, don't bother bringing a hammock to sleep because they're not allowed in most campgrounds. The shelters are usually a 16 by 10 lean-to with three sides covered, of course a roof, and the front side is screened in. They're free and you can't reserve them. Actually, your backpacking is free for group sizes of six and under, although you have to get a permit. Your national park daily fees are charged unless you have a park pass. During my week, I never had to share the three shelters I stayed in, but if it's crowded, then it's possible you might have to. You're allowed to set up your tent inside if you want a little bit more privacy, but I never bothered. I suppose in theory that you wouldn't have to bring a tent if you used only the shelter campgrounds and not all campgrounds had shelters, and count on the fact that chances are people are going to make room for somebody in a sleeping bag to fit in the shelter. Personally, I'd rather have the tent as a backup. Plus, this gave me the option to stay at all campgrounds, even those without a shelter. Plus, this gives you the flexibility to change your itinerary to stay at places without shelters, as my itinerary was completely different than what I told the rangers. One nice thing is all the campsites have pit toilets. Bring your own TP. Not all have a water source, so you need to be prepared and know where you're going to stay so you can plan accordingly. And everywhere, and especially on this pristine island, leave no trace. Pack it in, pack it out. In fact, pick up other people's litter too that you might see. The only time I didn't pick up some of the rare litter I saw was in one shelter. Someone had left the back half of a paperback book about a sniper in the Iraq War. 
This wasn't a book I would normally pick up, but it was actually an interesting read and I left it for another hiker to enjoy. At the same shelter, somebody left a really large glass liquor bottle, that empty of course, that I didn't want to carry 20 miles. I figured a ranger with a boat could get that one. Also, you have to bring your own water filtration system. There are plenty of lakes from which to get water. Surprisingly, I read where dehydration is the biggest problems rangers see, and I don't understand that. Maybe when you're up in the ridge, folks aren't bringing enough water, and it's much hotter up there than the lake. That's all I can figure on that one. Another thing, I did see some backpackers that put themselves at risk by not bringing the proper gear. One man I met was hiking the ridge end to end. He told me he'd check the weather forecast before he and his two sons took the ferry over. The weather forecast called for 70s during the day and 50s at night. Perfect hiking weather. So he just packed cotton t-shirts and shorts. Lake Superior can create its own weather, just like a mountain can. Plus the temperatures in the ridge differ 10 degrees from the coast. The weather forecast was wrong. He got lucky and he was only cold two nights, but he could have found himself in a serious situation because he made two big mistakes. One, he was wearing cotton. There's a saying, cotton kills. When cotton gets wet and it's not super hot, it can take a long time for it to dry. You can start getting hyperthermia, even when the temperatures are in their 40s if you're wearing wet cotton. So for safety, always bring quick drying performance gear and never wear cotton. The second mistake he made was to not bring gear for four seasons. He should have had a thermal jacket even if he didn't think he needed it. He was seriously lucky that he was just cold those nights. Most of the wildest landscapes I've visited, people who die, die not from bear attacks or injuries like most people worry about, but from exposure due to not having the proper clothing. So yes, we got the forecast before we left, but you know how reliable forecasts are, right? Once we entered the woods, we would have no way of knowing that the forecast deteriorated. So be safe and always be prepared for it all. I'll put links to my Adventure Travel Show podcast episodes that can help you plan your gear packing list for an adventure like this. I should note that the rangers and brochures warn you that most people overestimate their abilities and what they'll be able to do in a day. So it's better to be conservative. I'm going to put the mileage chart of the distances between the different campsites on the website to give you an idea. I'm also going to put the portages chart as well for those that would like to paddle pack, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So how much did my pack weigh and what did I bring? My base pack weight I know is around 17 pounds from having weighed everything back when I had a house at a scale and from keeping a printed backpacking checklist with the gear weights listed in my camping gear tub. So to the 17 pounds, I have to add my food. Without having a scale, I estimate for six days my food had to weigh 9 to 10 pounds, that of course felt like 20 pounds. Water was readily available, so I generally only had a liter in my water bladder, plus some backup in my water bottle to warm me to ration some water if my bladder should run out. So at any given time, I'm carrying around 30 to 32 pounds. Ideally, you want to try to keep your total pack weight with food, water, and gear to below 25% of your body weight. That's to protect your knees, lower back, etc. And you should train to get to that. So that was a little boo-boo I did, but I was hoping that I'd compensated by the fact that I've been hiking so much. And I usually carry a day pack with too much water. So it ended up working out all right. One mistake I did make, though, was not to bring two water bottles. To save weight, I thought this would be smart since water wasn't supposed to be an issue. And I normally do have two, but I said, oh, you know, there's 70 lakes. I'm surrounded by water. What's the big deal? I'm not going to get too dehydrated no matter when I run out of water, should I run out of water. However, I'm used to treating water from a stream and not a lake. And I learned there's a big difference in collection. I brought my Sawyer Squeeze, and that's a bag that you put the unfiltered water in, and then you squeeze it through the ceramic filter. However, lake water doesn't automatically fill the bag like a stream does. So I had to use my one water bottle to collect the dirty water and then pour it into the bag. That meant I have now contaminated my water bottle so I could only drink from my bladder mouthpiece. This was a pain. So to pour water into my stove pot, for example, I'd have to squeeze it directly in the pot or empty it out of the bladder. That was just a nuisance. It's not the end of the world, but life would have been a lot easier if I'd carried the extra few ounces of a second water bottle. And then I just have to make sure I didn't confuse the two. 
It would be a good idea to label 1D for dirty in case you ever have to differentiate your water bottles between the clean and the dirty. So as not to bore you, I'll put a list of exactly what I packed for my trip on the website at activetraveladventures.com. But I will tell you, I packed very minimally and gratefully outside of emergency gear. I used and needed everything I packed, and that's the goal. Remember, when backpacking, you're trading comfort during the day for comfort during the night. Thus, the less weight you carry during the day, the less luxuries you're going to have when you're resting at night or at camp. I prefer and lean towards less weight during the day, so I'm a little bit less comfortable at night, but I'm not a hardcore ultralight backpacker. One thing I was glad that I brought and was debating whether to bring due to weight was shoes, was trying to decide which shoes to bring. Since I interviewed Grand Canyon Mary and hearing her advice, I had switched to trail runners. But for this trip, A, I wasn't sure of the terrain and kept hearing the word rugged, and B, I knew I'd be carrying a lot of weight. So I opted to wear my heavy-duty hiking boots instead of the trail runners or even hiking shoes. This turned out to be a good call. I needed the support that the heavier boots bring, not just for carrying that excess backpack weight, but also because the trails are very rocky and the land itself, as I mentioned earlier, tilts. So your ankles are often at an angle. Remember how earlier in the program, you know, remember I was talking about that tilting rock layered rock cake. So your ankles are at an angle a lot. I also packed and was glad that I used my heavy duty knee braces for the added support they gave me. I'm not sure I would have needed them had I trained to backpack with that weight, but that extra support of my knees, considering I had not trained, I think was smart. I really wanted to avoid blowing out my knees before I head over to Europe. Back when I hiked the West Highland Way, I hurt my right knee and it took close to a year for it to completely heal. And I hurt it by carrying too much weight without enough training. Frankly, regarding this whole trip, before I went, I was a bit concerned that I bit off more than I could chew. When I decided I'm going to backpack Isle Royale, I figured surely I could make it to the three mile campground three miles away. And you're allowed to stay there for up to three nights. And from there, I could make it another four miles to Daisy Farm. And I was allowed to stay there another three nights. So worse came to worse, I could jiggle those two campsites without hiking more than four miles in a day. At the harbor itself, there's a campground pretty close by that you're allowed to stay for a single night. So I figured between these three close campgrounds, if worse came to worse, if my body wasn't up to this challenge, all I'd have to do would be to backpack no more than 14 miles total. So I figured I'd be okay one way or the other. As it turns out, I was very proud of my body. It handled the weight just fine. I never even needed to take a vitamin I, ibuprofen, for the entire trip. I ended up hiking about 50 miles total, 40 of which was backpacked and the rest day hiking. On that first day, we docked at Rock Harbor just before noon, so I decided on a final hot meal before I hit the trail, since I'd brought some fairly nasty backpacking food to get me through the week. My goal was lightweight calories, and I was seriously embarrassed checking out at the grocery store with all the crap food I brought. Instant mashed potatoes, beef jerky, instant oatmeal, trail mix, candy, chicken and tuna salad packets, Nora's pasta, hot chocolate, and my regular Nutella and peanut butter wraps. It looked like I was a college kid on a binge. After a few days, virtually all backpacking food will taste delicious because you're so hungry and tired. You're grateful for all small pleasures. But the first couple of days, yuck. So after my hot burger and chips, I hit the coastal trail. Putting on the pack made me wince, but my body seemed to handle the weight just fine and I made it to my hope for campground, Daisy Farm, seven miles away without incident. And they have shelters here, and I grabbed one so I didn't even need to set up my tent. I hadn't realized, but this was my very first solo backpacking trip. Perhaps I should have done so on less remote terrain, but gratefully, I managed to do this trip without incident. Vagabonding as I do now, I spent a ton of time on my own, so I really didn't think solo backpacking would be any different. What I forgot was that one, even though I knew I wouldn't have internet, I still wouldn't be able to listen to previously downloaded podcasts as I love to do because I wouldn't want to run out my battery. And two, 
I wouldn't even have a book to read because I wouldn't want to carry the weight. And for the same reason, I also didn't bring a solo charger. So usually it was just me and me and me to keep myself company. Most days I finished my hike by around one o'clock, two o'clock. This far north, it seems to never get dark in the summer. So it was often a long afternoon into evening before I went to bed. That's why I so enjoyed that half of a paperback that somebody left. And I rarely saw anyone with whom to chat, particularly as you get away from the main harbor area. Like Daisy Farm, you'll see tons of people. But as you get inland, not so much. So on these long afternoons, I ended up studying the little things, like my favorite black and white dragonflies that were out in mass at West Chicken Bone Campground. As many as six would simultaneously sun themselves on the outside of my tent. I liked how once they landed, they tilt up their wings, kind of like Dracula, holding up his cape. There were also black and white butterflies here as well. They liked drinking the salty sweat on the inside of my boots. So I'd whittle away the afternoons simply watching the little movements of nature, especially loving the dancing leaves of the aspen caught in a breeze. However, my first night at Daisy Farm, I actually had some socialization. I met Vern and Pete on the dock outside the Daisy Farm campground, and we chatted for an hour. It would turn out that they were the only backpackers I ever saw older than me. I was certainly the oldest woman I saw by far, which made me puff up my chest a little bit. I also didn't see another solo hiker my entire trip except for the last day when I was day hiking around the lodge. And that made me feel like a badass at almost 62 years old. I joined Vern and Pete back at their picnic table a little later, and then again before we both headed out in the morning. Two gals they had met previously on the trail had also arrived at camp, saw them, and also joined us. I found it amusing that like so many women in my audience, their husband and boyfriend didn't want to do anything like this, so the two gals in their 30s just came out on a big old adventure all on their own. I loved the story sharing and how everybody was laughing already about their foibles and mishaps. This group was on their way back to civilization while I had just begun my journey. And both Vern and Pete had already taken a dunk in the swamp. And before I tell this story, I should first mention that many of the boardwalks going over swamps and bogs are in poor repair due to lack of funding and manpower. You can see where the helicopters have dropped replacement boards and log supports, but the park simply doesn't have the manpower to replace them. I found that very sad to see in one of the national treasures of the United States. I kept saying to myself whenever a plank seesawed on me, startling me, how the powers that be in D.C. can find the funds to set themselves up in five-star resorts at Jackson Hole, and how they love to design new projects on which to spend our tax dollars, but they can't manage to fund taking care of our existing ones. I'm going to be writing a lot of politicians after this trip to express my outrage. There are many a bog plank that you gingerly step on that you wonder if you're going to be that one final straw that breaks the camel's back, or in this case the plank's back, and will end up in the bog like Pete and Vern. But their plunge was not from disrepair though, and I definitely wanted to learn from their experience. Pete fell when he turned to look at something and the weight of his backpack shifted throwing him off balance into the drink. Vern Swan dived into the muck as he jokingly tells the story when he stepped on a skunk cabbage leaf laying across a plank. It was dry on top, but wet and slippery underneath. So he slipped most gracefully into the bog. Memo to self, always stop and plant your poles for balance before turning to look at anything and don't step on any vegetation on the planks. Of course, they're laughing about it now. These are examples of type two fun. Certainly not fun while it's happening, but it becomes funny when you're dry again, and it's certainly fun in the telling of the story. While we're on the subject of the planks, I want to mention that I think to backpack and maybe even to day hike these trails, you should have good balance and strong ankles. You are walking on a lot of rocks, roots, and bedrock, so you need good foot placement. And like I mentioned earlier, your ankles are often hiking on a tilt. I would also urge poles not just because they prevented me from stumbling forward at least a half a dozen times or from slipping backwards on my butt a few times more, but I think they help your balance as you tightrope walk across the bogs. Some of these gangplanks may run 300 feet long and for the most part you're walking on a 12 inch wide plank. Sometimes on the higher bridges there'll be two planks width, but for the most part, say 98% of the time, you're walking over a single board. And remember, you know how to walk in a straight line and you can contain your feet within 12 inches, 
but the mind can sometimes feel intimidated surrounding by all that water, muck, and boggy plants. Be sure to check out the website at activetravelaventures.com slash Isle Royale. You'll see a lot of pictures of some of the stuff that I'm talking about today. My two favorite campgrounds, and before I go on, I'm going to tell you one thing, that you must stay in a campground unless you get a special cross-country permit. And frankly, there is such dense vegetation, I don't see how you could even bushwhack off the trail myself. Plus, this island was mined, and there would be hidden mines to fall into. So, near the harbor, some of these mines are fenced off just to prevent that mishap, but I don't know so much in inland, and there was a lot of mining done here back in the day. So going back to my two favorite campgrounds, it was West Chicken Bone, where I watched the dragonflies and butterflies, and Chippewa Harbor. I loved these because I was able to camp right by the water with a gorgeous view. But my absolute favorite camp view was a surprise treat I got on my last morning. I'd finally put off nature's call as long as I could and ventured to the pit toilet at 5.30 in the morning. It's already broad daylight and I couldn't go back to sleep. So I just rested back in my sleeping bag in the cozy lean-to shelter with my eyes closed under my eye mask. Suddenly, I heard a rustling noise in the vegetation just outside the lean-to and opened my eyes to see a ginormous bull moose just outside my shelter. He was less than 20 feet away and didn't seem to know I was there. I watched him eat for a few minutes and then got the courage to stand up and take his picture, which I'll put on the website. He was magnificent, and frankly, if he were any closer, he'd have had to sit at my picnic table. I was so thrilled, and it was an answered prayer to see a moose before I left, because I hadn't seen one on my first five days, and today was my last day. Lightning struck twice that day. While walking on the planks across a bog while heading towards Scoville Point on Stoll Trail near the harbor, I heard that same rustling noise and looked up. After first, of course, Having learned from Vern and Pete's mishaps, planting my hiking sticks on the plank for balance before I turned my head in my pack. Yep, another moose. I startled him, and he startled me, and I was way too close. Remember how you mentioned before how you're supposed to hold your arm straight out with your hand in the thumbs up position, and your thumb is supposed to completely cover the wildlife in question, or else you're too close? Well, my thumb wouldn't cover that moose's private parts, as he was only about 25 feet away. On the first day at the restaurant, I'd seen a sign saying that if a moose charged you, that I was, to, I was supposed to hide behind a tree for protection. But in this swamp, there wasn't a tree wider than 10 inches to hide behind, and they were all far away from the planks. So I paused so we could assess each other, and then I slowly backed away, stepping sideways so I didn't accidentally fall in. I continued to watch him from about 50 or 60 feet away until he crossed over the boardwalk plank to the other side and disappeared into the brush. It's estimated there are between 600 and 2,000 moose on the island, so I probably hiked near a dozen of them and didn't even know it. Unless they're right in your line of sight or you hear them rustling in the woods or, or swimming across a pond, I imagine you're so busy looking at your feet in the trail that you might be walking right by some. The vegetation here is so dense that I couldn't see this big fellow after he went five feet into the brush. But on the island, you're going to see lots of signs of moose throughout your adventure. You'll see moose tracks all over the muddy areas. Their hooves are about two-thirds the size of my feet, and I hear they weigh around a thousand pounds. There are also gray wolves on the island, around a dozen of them. The ranger said that these guys are really shy around humans, so you're unlikely to see one, but I did see one's poo on a boardwalk near Chippewa. It's like large dog do, but there's no dogs on the island. If you are into backpacking, but you're into paddling, there's some great options for you here on Isle Royale. Most paddle the inner lakes south from Cargo Cove or north from Chippewa Harbor. You can take the ferry with your canoe or kayak to either end. I'll put a portage chart on the website that describes the distance and difficulty and elevation change of the portages. Remember that Ranger advises conservative planning. I met four young people in their early 20s that were definitely having type 2 fun. They were portaging their two canoes from Lake Ritchie to Mosque Basin. Now, I'm sure when they were planning this over the winter, sitting in a recliner by the fire, sipping some hot chocolate, they thought, piece of cake, we can do this, we can do that. Fast forward to late June. One portage they chose is two miles with a 120-foot gradual grade change. Not a piece of cake. Two miles 
is not nothing. When you had to move your gear, which they told me took two trips, that's two miles up and back, that's four miles times two trips, that's eight miles, and then they got to go back and get the canoe. So they trudged 12 miles without ever putting their paddle in the lake that day. They were not happy campers. Definitely having to have too fun, but even they realized, we'll look back on this and think this is funny. It was kind of funny. And note that you do not have to do these kinds of portages if you paddle the interior lakes. Most portages are between 0.2 and 0.6 miles, with the worst being from Chickenbone to McCargo Cove at a hilly 1.2 miles. So maybe it'd be easier if you decide to paddle north, and then you'll have less food to haul at the end of your trip. Remember also when you do your planning that you need to coordinate everything with the daily Voyager ferry schedule if you plan on drop-offs and pickups. You can bring your own canoe or kayak or rent them. Experienced sea kayakers may want to tackle the perimeter of Lake Superior, but that wind can be a bear. The map on the website will give you a good idea about the lakes and harbors on Isle Royale. When I finally made it back to Rock Harbor, I grabbed one of the campground shelters, dumped my gear, cleaned up as best I could, and headed to the grill for a decent meal. They have showers, but I had no soap, shampoo, deodorant, or towel, so I decided a good washing my face and my body with my tiny 10-inch camoy would have to suffice one more day. I wore the same hiking shirt for four days straight, so I wore my only other hiking shirt that I kept clean for my town visits. My dirty hiking pants would have to do. The pizza and the draft went down sweet. The harbor is tiny, so you see the same visitors throughout the day, and you especially become friendly with the fellow hikers with whom you might have crossed paths over the days. Over lunch, I started chatting with two ladies at the table next to me, Joy and Linda. Joy is a retired National Parks Ranger. Isle Royale was her first post. She and her college roommate, Linda, rented a harbor cabin for a few days to catch up. They'd been friends about 50 years. They both laughed at the photos they were going to take at Linda being in the wilderness because she's such an admitted princess and was completely out of her element here. They graciously offered to let me charge up my phone and I readily agreed to stop by later to do so. When I did, they said they're going out for a walk and would be back in an hour or two. I found a book at the lounge area in the harbor and found a nice bench by the water and then sat down to read. After what I figured was a couple of hours, I headed to Joy and Linda's cabin to pick up my phone. No one was home, so I sat in the stoop and waited a while. Eventually, I got hungry. I decided to finish off the leftover pizza back at my shelter. En route, I asked somebody what time it was since I didn't have my phone. And I was surprised to hear it was almost 8 p.m. Remember, it stays light really late. So it had been well over three hours since I last saw the ladies. I thought perhaps we'd just missed each other and they'd gone out for dinner. After I ate my pizza, I headed back to their stoop with my book. Time marched on, and I'm getting really concerned. It was starting to get dark, which, like I said, this far north, that meant it was really late. So I decided to search for them in the harbor and restaurants, but found that everything was closed and had been for a couple of hours. Now I was really worried. I saw some park employees leaving a building after what appeared to be a dinner party. I told them about my concerns and that I was going to go look for the two ladies, but if I didn't find them, I asked who should I alert and where. The leader, a stout man in his late 50s wearing a Meryl Streep name tag, presumably from some party game, offered to take the golf cart and we would go search. We headed first to the seaplane dock. This is where Linda and Joy were heading first, and I remembered that the plane had just arrived when I last saw them. That time stamped their departure to be 4.30 p.m. It's now almost 10 p.m., five and a half hours later. Meryl Streep and I continued along all the paths the cart could go and saw no signs of the ladies. Back in the harbor, Meryl was radioing to start a search when out of the woods came two very weary and disheveled women who at dusk appeared like they might be the gals. When I hollered, hooray, it was them. I called a thank you to Meryl and ran to them. It turns out when they had reached Tobin Harbor, which was the second place they told me they were heading, they decided to continue on to see Susie's cave, a quite nice large cave further inland. They hadn't realized how far away it was, and by the time they did, it was about as long to come back on the main trail as the original trail they took. Tired, thirsty, and worn out, the three of us headed to their cabin where they introduced me to Moscow Mules, a delightful drink that we all really needed after that scare. After hiking so many miles in this wilderness, Linda, the princess, actually earned her wilderness picture stripes, so I don't think she can call herself a princess anymore. The gals did great, especially at 70 years old. 
I was proud of them, although I wish they had brought a day pack with the essentials. They almost got stuck in the woods at night without a headlamp, jacket, water, or emergency kit. Alfred Stoll Jr., the man who fought to preserve this wild island, has a quote I like. Isle Royale is a part of an entirely different world than the one in which we labor daily. It knows nothing and cares less of the triumphs of modern civilization. Those that visit Isle Royale, especially those who backpack or paddle pack, need to remember that while the island doesn't care about modern civilization, it also doesn't care about you. So you better be prepared to take care of yourself out here because you are the only one that you can count on to do so. After six days in this wilderness, it was time for me to head to the mainland. Joy and Linda were on my ferry, so I sat down with them. The sea wasn't glass like I was lucky enough to ride over on, but it wasn't bad. It had around two foot swells. Nonetheless, after about four hours of rolling up and down, I was a bit green, and even though I was looking forward to treating myself to a special dinner at the popular Harbor House, my stomach couldn't take it. I was slightly nauseous until I went to sleep that night. Lodging in Copper Harbor runs the gamut, but it's mostly older motor inns and cabins, plus a couple of campgrounds, which I prefer. The night before my Isle Royale trip, I stayed at the campground at Fort Wilkinson State Park. It was nice enough, but I'm glad that I switched to the Fanny Ho Resort and campground on my return. I'd recommend this campground or its lodge if you stay in Copper Harbor. It's just a few blocks from the harbor, and it sits on the beautiful Fanny Ho Lake, which is perfect for canoeing or kayaking or taking out a putt-putt boat. Me, I was so fried from backpacking and still a little bit seasick, so there was no way I was going back out in the water. So I just took a beer to enjoy by sitting on a bench along the river, watching the others putts around the lake. Fanny Ho Resort has nicely wooded campsites, plus some pull-through RV sites. The next day at the food truck, I shared a lunch table from some people who were staying at, at Fanny Ho Lodge. They liked it as well. But before my beer at the lake even, it was time to get clean. After six days without a proper bath, I really appreciated the high water pressure of a hot shower. There's only so much washing a baby wipe can do. I was so tired when I arrived that I just showered and chilled out. I should have mustered the strength to wash my hiking clothes from my backpacking trip. I noticed there was a noticeable stench in my van that night. So laundry was the first item of the day when I woke up. Fortunately, they had machines on site so I could sit and look at the lake while the washer performed its magic. I managed to clean and dry out all my sleeping gear the first morning as well. This is a big operation. You don't want to open all your gear back up on your next trip to find your tent or sleeping bag all mildewed. Yuck. I did learn a new lesson on this trip. I am fanatical about cleaning and drying my gear upon return, so it never crossed my mind that I should inspect and test everything before I set out. This is a mistake that could have been a big mistake. Like I mentioned, I hadn't needed my tent in a couple of years because I was either hiking end to end or with a tour company who provided the gear for me. So it had never crossed my mind that sitting in storage that my gear would deteriorate. When I had arrived at West Chicken Bone in the rain, I must add, I tried to set up my tent as quickly as possible in hopes of keeping as much rain out of the tent as possible. Big problem. The elastic that holds the frame tubing together, it's kind of like skinny bungee cords, had lost all their mojo. The cords had stretched out and simply dangled rather than spring tightly to hold the assorted tubes together. Thus, there was too much cord to shove down the tubes. So in the rain, I grabbed my knife and cut the cord so I could shorten it. It would have been a really easy replacement at home had I checked ahead of time. And also, had I set up the tent again, I wouldn't have to rethink how to do it because, it, like I said, it's been a couple years since I did it. It's not hard, but it helps if you've done it repeatedly and you just do it by rote. So a good lesson to learn is open up and test out everything before you head out if you haven't used it recently. And definitely test out new gear ahead of time. I knew that for big stuff, but the little stuff too? I had brought a new mini blow-up pillow. I bring one luxury item and a little small pillow is my luxury. Who would think you need to test out a blow-up pillow, right? Apparently you do. Mine had a defective blow-up valve. I was red in the face trying to get air into this tiny 8 by 12 inch balloon-like pillow, but I finally got it filled. The bigger problem was in the morning trying to deflate it. The air wouldn't come out, so I had to use my knife to pop it as there wasn't room in my backpack to fit the inflated version. And it turns out that my clothing dry sack made a better pillow anyway, especially on warmer nights when I could stuff my puffy jacket in there. So now I'm going to forego a pillow in the future. 
I got lucky on my miscues. As remote and as wild as our Royale is, if the weather was bad and I was out of sight without one of the shelters and couldn't assemble my tent, I could have been in trouble. So I will test, test, test in the future. I also learned that it's time to get some new gear. When I laid out all my gear so I could compile the list for today's website, I realized that after a decade of wonderful service, much of my gear was getting a little long in the tooth. The interior waterproofing of my beloved backpack is starting to peel off and it's time to replace it. The elastic of my tent is certainly worth repairing because the tent isn't that old and is otherwise great condition. My stove system is on its last legs as well, it appears. My water filtration system is sprouting a leak near the spout, meaning some contaminated water can drip into the clean water if I'm not careful. So I'll be replacing these items for sure before my next adventure. But in the meantime, it is the 4th of July holiday weekend. My body needs to recover and I don't feel like driving over the holiday. So I decide to stay an extra three nights at the Fanny Hill Campground in Copper Harbor. I like this little town. Yes, it attracts tourists who want to visit the Pioneer Fort, see the lighthouse and Rocky Shoreline, and of course take the ferry over to Isle Royale. But that's not all that attracts folks here. It seems like about half the vehicles are cart and mountain bikes. Keweenaw Peninsula offers the best mountain biking in the Midwest including the Copper Harbor IMBA Silver Level Ride Center with more than 37 miles of single track through untamed hardwood forest and bluffs overlooking Lake Superior. For less experienced riders, there are single track trails at the Sweet Town Rec area in Hooten and Michigan Tech and Churning Rapids. There are even technical trails in the Mine Ruins Adventure Mine about 45 minutes south of Hooten. In downtown Copper Harbor, you can pick up several local trails, some mixed hiking and biking. When I went for a ride, I must have passed a couple dozen bike trailheads just here in town. And you don't need to bring your gear as there's several places in town from which to rent. You can also join a guided tour with Keweenaw Adventures. The Keweenaw Peninsula also boasts 30 hiking trails so you can explore on foot this amazing landscape. Keweenaw Adventure also offers several Lake Superior guided sea kayaking tours in addition to rentals. And if you fish, there's an abundance of lakes and rivers. And if you don't, be sure to try the local whitefish straight from Lake Superior. While in Copper Harbor, enjoy fish and chips or fish tacos at the local food truck right next to Brightside Brewery. It was delicious. And for dinner one night, I finally made it to the Harbor House. This Swedish restaurant in the harbor has great food. Some hikers I met in the island recommended the whitefish plank, so I went for that, and a refreshing watermelon and arugula salad. Even though the food is top notch, people dress very casually here, even on a Saturday night. One of the restaurant's traditions is for the staff to welcome the incoming Isle Royale Ferry with a chorus line dance on the banks of the harbor each evening. If you don't want to eat out, there's a tiny general store that has modest provisions. You can make a nice vacation just staying at Copper Harbor, even if you don't make it over to Isle Royale. The summer weather is absolutely delightful. Right now, there's a terrible heat wave oppressing much of the country, and I'm sitting under a tree at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and not sweating. I love this weather. And if you love history or geology, there's plenty to keep you interested here as well. In 1843, the first mineral boom in the U.S. happened right here in the Keweenaw Peninsula and the mineral was copper. They found the largest vein of readily accessible copper up here. This created, instead of a gold rush, a copper rush, with intrepid miners rushing to seek their fortune. Veins of silver and iron were also mined. This area produced more than 10 times the wealth of the California gold rush and produced the copper used to develop lines for that newfangled thing called a telephone. You'll see evidence of all mines throughout the region and can take mining tours. Be sure to stay on the trails as overgrowth can hide an old mine, and I don't want you falling into one. The easy ore has long been mined out and the industry faded, but you, wandering along the beaches or trails, might find your own collectible Lake Superior agate, some native copper, or even the fluorescent eupolite. If you're into rocks, check out the Mineral Museum in Hooten. Once the easy ore was mined, many towns were abandoned, so you can explore a dozen and a half ghost towns. There are a dozen old lighthouses dotting the shoreline that helped earlier ships safely navigate the water to transport all that copper. Each has its own charm. The local adventure guide found at the visitor center can tell you how to best see them. Also at the visitor center is the best Wi-Fi found in town, but up here your cell signal is going to be weak. 
Fall is a great time to explore the peninsula. All those gorgeous hardwoods put on a fantastic show before the snow and cold weather sets in. The rains return in September and October, so the waterfalls are replenished as well. The northern lights pick up again as the seasons change, and you might get lucky enough to see a light show one night. I don't cover winter sports, but if you're into that kind of thing, they have it all up here, including the snowmobile trails all over the place. If you get tired of adventure, take a beautiful drive over to Eagle Harbor, about 14 miles up the coast. I drove the coastal route there, and there's lots of daytime only pullouts so you can explore the rocky shore, around 20 beaches, some of which are even sandy. But on the way back, I climbed the 10 mile Brockway Mountain Drive to get some beautiful panoramic views. On one side you see mountains, and the other side you see Lake Superior and the rocky coast. On the second viewpoint, just above Copper Harbor's marina, you get a great eagle's eye view of the village and the harbor. April and May is another great time to explore waterfalls that come raging to life with the spring snow melt. There are 11 great local falls to explore. And if you're brave enough to come during the winter, these majestic falls turn into ice sculptures. Near the harbor, you can also explore a great example of a pioneer fort just about a mile from town the Fort Wilkinson State Park. It's open in the summer months only, and while exploring, you'll experience living history as there'll be college students dressed and acting the part of former residents and army soldiers at the fort. You'll come away with a clear understanding of the hardships endured by these stoic people. The fort, built in 1844, was intended to bring order in case there was an issue between the local Chippewa natives who had just transferred the land to the U.S. government officials. The place was hopping due to the copper rush, but no conflicts ever occurred. The fort was abandoned after just two years as the troops were needed for the Mexican War and the easy copper ore had quickly been mined. The 12 surviving buildings are in great condition and are furnished for the period. I thoroughly enjoyed my adventure in Isle Royale and Copper Harbor and strongly recommend this trip. They say people get island fever and that's why so many return to Isle Royale, making it, as I said earlier, the most revisited national park. I have such a long list of places I want to see before I die, and it is rather difficult to get here, but I certainly understand the pull. I hope to make it to Minnesota so I can canoe Boundary Waters one day, and if I do, I imagine I'll find myself on the west end of the Isle Royale to see what mysteries lie there, because I was just on the east and in the middle of the island. I hope you've enjoyed listening about my Isle Royale and Copper Harbor adventures. Don't forget to email me at kit at activetraveladventures.com if you want information on the Costa Rica Camino trip for April of 2022, or just let me know what you're up to and give me some feedback on the show. I appreciate you listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks, Adventure On! Adventure On!